remember that everything sound fire smoke early on the morning of august 6th 1997 korean air flight 801 was scheduled to land at guam's international airport it was raining that morning and part of the airport's landing guidance system was down for maintenance at about 150 something went wrong the plane crashed into the Nimitz Hill area, part of Command Naval Forces Marianas. It grazed the fuel pipeline and skidded a half mile or so. The main wreckage came to rest here, in a small valley about three miles from the runway. What happened next is where our story begins. I'm Senior Airman Fitzgerald Stewart. And I'm Specialist Dan Milbauer. Join us and meet the military men and women who responded to this tragedy. You'll see how dozens of units from different services came together to provide maximum response and how their training helped in the search, rescue, recovery, and return of survivors. He said that a uh, 747 had crashed on Guam and that it was real world. So of course I got dressed, came in, was in within 10 minutes. As soon as I got through the doors, I was whisked off on the first ambulance out. It was dark, so we really didn't see much other than the fire and the smoke. Once the sun r rose, we saw where the fire, the extent of the fire. I've been to several other type of disasters, but never a, a plane crash, so I, I couldn't say what it would look like. I didn't even imagine what it would look like. I expected, like you see on TV, where there's debris scattered for miles and miles and stuff like that. It wasn't really like that. It was like the plane had just come to rest right on the hillside and, and broke into about four or five pieces. Amazingly, survivors crawled from those pieces. Rescue crews immediately began pulling more from the fiery wreckage. When we first arrived, uh, we knew we had two trap victims. Uh, through one of the holes, we could see the mother, her head, and we were talking to her through the hole. Uh, through the other end, where we eventually had to pull them out, all we could see of the daughter was her hand and part of her shoulder and she was screaming and hollering she wanted her mom which was a good sign because she was breathing and she was well aware of what was going on around her uh, the mother she didn't say anything she was <clears throat> except where's my daughter that was her sole concern but in the thick jungle there was no easy way to transport them to safety that's when the cb's naval mobile construction battalion 133 came on scene our initial uh, tasking was to uh some of the road around the area was uh, very muddy, as you can see, and the road had to be uh, covered with gravel so that people could drive through the area, get access. It would help speed up the recovery. And they did a, they did a, a really good job. Uh, they that, said, this is where we need a road, and they built it. That road allowed survivors to be taken to Guam Memorial Hospital and nearby Naval Hospital, where Dr. John Burgess and his team were standing by. We were seeing mostly burns. Uh, second and third degree burns. Uh, there were some orthopedic injuries as well. Uh, we had uh, only one orthopedic surgeon here on the island at the time, so we kept him quite busy. Uh, and that was really the majority of the injuries. The survivors were shipped out by, uh, you know, military medevac flights uh, to a number of different areas, as I understand. Help continued to pour in from around the Pacific, a C-9 from Yokota Air Base flew eight of the non-critical patients back to Seoul. I'm, anyway, I am thanked to uh, military, the U.S. military man. You can just see what he went through, through, just looking at him. It's like every patient you looked at, you just wonder what went through their head, being that they're the only ones that survived. I don't want to remember that, everything. Sound, fire. Smoke. I don't want to be The hardest part was the emotional strain of trying to look past the patient's wounds and just dealing with what they were going through. Because not only did they need physical support, they also needed emotional support during takeoff, during landings, during turbulence. Because you could see and feel the fear that they were feeling. Well, I'm going to say Kempo, okay? We'll be on the ground about 20 minutes. 
Identified and marked it, but we're not going to remove it. What we're trying to get out is uh, human remains so they can get back to their families. Military search, rescue, and excavation teams worked around the clock in the days following the crash, looking for anything that might help in the investigation or bring comfort to crash victims' families. All right, think safe. Remember what the rules are. Work in pairs, in twos or more. This is real stuff. This is actual where we're going to have to go in there and pick up the remains and, you know, with the training we watch videos and they explain to us so it really, there's a really big difference from training and the real, uh, the real thing. You know, helping the families uh, make sure they have their loved ones to, you know, remember them later on. They, you know, maybe they won't have everything but they'll have as much as they can to remember and, you know, and I know we're helping them and, and I think, you know, helping those folks out would be the biggest part of this that I'll always remember. The jumbo jet carried 254 people. 28 of those survived the crash. Teams were able to recover 203 bodies. 23 of the passengers are still unaccounted for. The island as a whole did real well. Um, People pull together. Everybody in time of need seems to pull together for one common goal. Uh, down, on the, down on the fire ground, there was no politics. There was no, I'm Air Force, you're Navy, I'm Gov. Um, it was everybody working together as a team. The Air Force and Navy joined together and set up who was going to be in charge and who needed to be where, who needed to be where and who didn't need to be where, because there was a lot of, you know, you don't need to be here. So there was a lot of those type of people around. At the bottom of the site, um, and I've said this over and over again, it was amazing how everybody worked together. I mean, I didn't know the person standing next to me yet. They were there if I needed them. Uh, the Navy SEALs, I believe, came through part of the searching. They passed out water canteens to everybody, made sure people weren't passing out. Um, we heard lunch boxes came through with the Red Cross earlier at the top of the hill. The drinks down here, and then we'll set up inside. Right, Throughout the recovery, normal operations continued on the island. Airmen had been planning a Guam Appreciation Day for months. This air show and open house at Anderson was supposed to be the highlight of the week, but fate had other plans. The show goes on, but for the people involved in the aftermath of Flight 801, thoughts and feelings are still up on Nimitz Hill and the people at work there. Well, the response has been uh, superb and, and really overwhelming, uh, not only from a military perspective with the Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard contributing, but I think the coordination between the military and the civil community and the government agencies here has been truly outstanding. Uh, we had practiced something similar to this in the April time frame, uh, little realizing that we would have to put it to use, but the practice that we had done was, I think, borne out by the, the tremendous teamwork that was uh, island-wide, literally here, uh, in the aftermath of the tragedy. Within 36 hours of the crash, the National Transportation Safety Board arrived on scene. The focus of the recovery shifted to preserving evidence in hopes of finding the cause. Our main job was to uh, work with the NTSB board to uh, roll the cockpit back so that the uh, all the flight instrument gauges and knobs and stuff could pretty much stay in the same position so that they can take pictures and get some kind of estimate. Although no final report has been released yet, early indicators point toward a computer glitch in the airport's radar system as one of several possible contributors. The NTSB also discovered another safety device called the Minimum Safe Altitude Warning System was not working. This all led to what's called a controlled flight into terrain. This means the pilot may not have known anything was wrong right up until the plane hit the ground. The NTSB is still investigating the crash. So now there's just a time for healing even for them, not just the victims, you know, but for, for the people that had to be there to help. Their job is over. The survivors are safe, the victims recovered, and the investigation is underway. But for the military members who sifted through the wreckage of Flight 801, 
Memories of that rainy night will not fade anytime soon. Well, I've seen tragedies before, but this one is kind of like it sticks on you to make you believe or make you think and re realize that uh, life's not promised to you. And we sat back and we, and we talked about it and we went to a debriefing, um, but it didn't really set in until later that afternoon and the next day, probably 24, 48 hours, you know. I, myself and, and a couple others, we talked and you, you just kind of walk around in a daze. When I'm on scene, I put my personal feelings aside. I don't even think about my personal feelings. They, you know, it can be a 90-year-old lady or a, a one-day-old baby, and I don't. I try my best not to think about the personal side of it. And then vice versa. When I come off of the scene, I do the same thing. I put the scene out there somewhere, and hopefully, it never comes back. But there, are all the, you know, there is those chances that it does come back to, to haunt you at later times. But I, I do my best, just try not to think about it. Um, I go home and hug my kid every time something happens. Just thank God he's he's safe with me. And it hits home because of uh, my daughter. My daughter's flying in on uh, Korean Airlines tomorrow morning, so it's you know I thank God that you know I picked the right day for her to fly in on it. She could have been on this plane. Our hearts are broken. We are uh, deeply emotionally uh, uh, affected by the circumstances because every time we see someone down there, it breaks our hearts. And this is very difficult. This is very painful. It gives you a sense of mortality. You know, uh, the military and in the fire protection, they kind of teach you to be 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Uh, they want us to be able to do things that normal people don't do. We run in burning buildings when most people run out. And when you see that, you know, it kind of flashes in your mind that hey, just a few hours ago, these people were living and breathing. Well, for me, once I dropped him off, I was, I was pretty upset. Um, I don't mind telling you, I did cry a little bit and all the way back and, and just, you know, nervousness for, you know, for those that have to go out there and deal with that. And there's always an amount of danger, you know, no matter what, even, you know, and, and it's just, it's just tough, you know, and spend the day just kind of being quiet because he was gone. He was working, so I couldn't talk to him. You know, you just keep praying that it'll be okay. Well, obviously, it's very, very tough duty. As a matter of fact, for our folks, uh, it's, it's the toughest duty I know that we can call upon them to do. We've had a lot of firemen that have been in the scenes, and, and they have a pretty graphic uh, uh, views and descriptive views of, of what happened and what they saw. And I think that affects all of us in, in different ways. But uh, we, need to, we need to look at uh, the people that we did save, and that, that's a plus and something that we can, we can uh, hold on to. The one thing that made me think, OK, there's a tragedy, but this is a little, you know, this is kind of a good thing that happens is when the last two survivors were out, we were like personally involved in that. We were helping out the fire department with the extrication. And when we actually saw them coming out and the little girl was crying, it was, it was kind of like you had to sit back and, as men, you know, <laughs> stop from crying yourself. But a little tear kind of rolled down the, down the cheek, and it, but it was OK. You, know? you got to focus on the positive. And the positive is, is we did save some lives. It could have been worse. There could have been no survivors. The jumble of emotions can build up inside. But military agencies are right there to provide support. We provide an ongoing one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling as well as group counseling for the uh, individuals who've been working on the site. We have two chaplains tasked to work with the uh, search and recovery teams there on the crash site. Uh, every time the team goes out to remove the bodies or the human remains. When I begin to see how they are affected, they begin to cry. Uh, they are emotionally disturbed, mentally, physically exhausted, and spiritually too. Then I am there to comfort them, to support them, to encourage them, and to remind them that what we see is one thing, what we believe is another thing. Worldwide, our military trains for tragedy and disaster that we hope never come. When Korean Air Flight 801 went down on Guam, our total force stood ready. For Specialist Dan Milbauer and the entire Regional News Center Pacific team, I'm Senior Airman Fitzgerald Stewart, Air Force News, Aganya, Guam.